This is a panel that will kind of take us from the level of doctrine that we're at before uh, into the trenches. We've got a bit of a flavor of that with <coughs> Professor Atmat's talk about what it was like to do these twin pieces of litigation, the DACA case and the travel ban case. We'll pick up on that in this hour in terms of looking at the real stakes for real people of immigration law, how that involves fact-finding in a number of different forums from immigration court to uh, citizenship and immigration services office. Could be a lawyer's office. Right? Could be an asylum office. Uh, and a lot of it also has to do with counseling clients. Some of those matters also occur in a criminal courtroom in state court because, we, as we've discussed before, immigration and criminal law interlinked. Criminal convictions have real-world immigration consequences for the next hour and 15 minutes. We're delighted to have a number of speakers with us in that capacity. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Shoba Wadia, who's here remotely. Uh, she wanted to be here in person very badly, but uh, she couldn't get a flight out of Penn State to get here in time for the conference. So uh, we talked about the travel ban earlier. It turns out that even traveling within the country <laughs> can be problematic. The good news is that we do have Shoba here remotely, thanks to the miracles of modern technology and our expert IT department, as well as the expert IT department at Penn State. Shoba is the director of the Center for Immigrants' Rights Clinic at Penn State. She's a longtime advocate <coughs> for immigrants for 20 years. Uh, she's, amongst other things, the drafter of the letter you may have heard about that's been referenced on the newsletter of 100 law professors on behalf of the legality of the DACA program. Job is also the author of a wonderful book that I strongly recommend to you, courtesy of NYU Press which is beyond deportation, the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration cases. A comprehensive study of the very important subject of the discretion that the government has over the lives of immigrants. Our next panelist will be Luis Mancheño. Luis is first and foremost an alumnus of the School of Law at Roger Williams University. Uh, but that's only one of his many accomplishments. He's also written up in a wonderful feature story in the New York Times. Gee, I wish that would happen to me. He's <laughs> also <laughs> been a fellow at Cardozo Law School in New York City. And before that and now, he is uh, an attorney at a wonderful, really path-breaking organization that has a long-time relationship with this law school, and that is the Bronx Defenders, really on the front lines of representing immigrants and other folks uh, with issues in the criminal justice system. Then we have Lenny Benson, who is a professor at New York Law School, where she is executive director of the Safe Passage Project. Lenny has for years tirelessly labored on behalf of kids dealing with the difficult issues that kids face in the immigration system. Tough enough for an adult <laughs> to deal with the uncertainty of immigration. You just imagine that 100 times over, what it's like for a kid. And then last, but most definitely not least, we have Mark Nofri, who is with the Executive Office of Immigration Review of the Justice Department, the United States Department of Justice. That agency is otherwise known as the Immigration Court, a vital agency for the adjudication of asylum claims and other claims involving immigrants. Mark is also someone who's been long active on immigration law and policy issues. Uh, amongst other things, he worked at the Im uh, American Immigration Council. He worked at Brooklyn Law School and with the committee of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. I also have to say on a personal note, uh, everyone in this field of immigration is just a remarkably decent person. That's one great kind of fringe benefit of working in the field. But I have to say that Mark's decency and integrity are second to none. <laughs> Thanks. Shoba, go ahead. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Professor Margulies. Can you all hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great. I'm sorry to not be there in person. Uh, and I hope that the few minutes I spend with you virtually um, bring value. I, I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about discretion, which plays an important role as we think about immigration enforcement and access to justice. As you've probably seen from the earlier panels and heard, immigration law is complex and derives from many sources. The immigration statute has been compared second in complexity to the U.S. tax code and outlines many of the features and elements that you've learned about so far, like who might qualify for admission temporarily or permanently, what type of relief might be available for somebody who is fleeing harm or facing removal. Um, and there are several agencies that carry out this immigration law, including the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. You'll hear more about that um, momentarily. And despite all of this complexity, the laws we have and the agencies who carry it out, there is this important concept of discretion in the immigration system. And it was quoted by Justice Kennedy in the Arizona case as follows, quote, discretion in the enforcement of immigration law embraces immediate human concerns. The equities of an individual case may turn on many factors, including whether the alien has children born in the United States, long time ties to the community, or a record of distinguished military service, end quote. And so one of the most powerful forms of discretion in immigration law is called prosecutorial discretion, or PD. And it refers to the choice that the Department of Homeland Security, as opposed to a judge, makes about whether to bring enforcement actions against a person or a group of persons. And PD has operated in the immigration system for as long as the system has been in existence. And there are three major underpinnings to PD. The first is economic. The agency has resources to deport 400,000 or less than 4% of the 11.2 million people living in the U.S. without authorization. And so choices have to be made about who to target for removal and who to place on the back burner. The second dimension is humanitarian, and Justice Kennedy really highlights the humanitarian dimension of all discretion, but PD as well where there are individuals who are living in the U.S. with compelling qualities or equities like long-term residence or a family relationship that may warrant short-term protection from removal. And then finally, there's this political dimension to prosecutorial discretion. When Congress fails to act or acts in ways that minuses discretion um, on the part of judges, there are more demands that are placed on the executive to do something through discretion. And so these are the three theories that have always underlied prosecutorial discretion. Um, and one question that has really received a lot of attention in the last few years is whether prosecutorial discretion is legal. Um, and there are several authorities that tell us the answer is yes. Um, beginning with the take care clause of the U.S. Constitution and the responsibility for the president to ensure that the laws of the United States are faithfully executed. And the U.S. Supreme Court has long found that prosecutorial discretion is part of this faithful execution. Section 103 of the Immigration and Nationality Act is a critical section where Congress delegated to the Department of Homeland Security the authority to enforce and administer the immigration laws of the United States. And this has long been identified as the helm within the immigration statute guiding the authority for prosecutorial discretion. And other authorities are in the regulations, memoranda, other parts of the statute. And you can read the letter that was alluded to by Professor Margulies by 105 law professors in an open letter to President Trump on August 14th, defending the legality of DACA. A little bit more on that in a few minutes. So what does immigration enforcement and discretion look like in the Trump administration? 
In January, President Trump signed three executive orders and two pertained to immigration enforcement. One to enforcement at the border and the second to enforcement on the interior of the United States. And there were several elements to this interior enforcement executive order, um, but one was to refashion and reframe the administration's enforcement priorities. And the priorities that are listed in that order include not only the crime, security, and misrepresentation related grounds of deportability and inadmissibility in the immigration statute, um, but also seem to go much further than that to reach, for example, those who commit acts that may constitute a criminal or chargeable criminal offense. Um, so unresolved crimes or somebody who is a visa overstay and also jaywalks in a jurisdiction where jaywalking is a chargeable offense could conceivably be considered a priority under a plain reading of this executive order. So beyond these orders were guidance documents published by the Department of Homeland Security in February of this year, seeking to interpret what these executive orders mean. And, and throughout these guidance documents is the following expression, quote, all of those in violation of the immigration laws may be subject to immigration arrest, detention, and if found removable by final order, removal from the United States, end quote. And so when you see language like this plastered throughout a guidance document, and then also uttered in the words of the administration and our president, one is left with the impression, or at the very least fear, that everyone is a priority. This cumulative effect of using expressions that say that all those in violation of the immigration law almost throw priorities out the window and make any person who's here without authorization a supposed priority. So a natural question for, for me as, as somebody who researches prosecutorial discretion and for the public is whether prosecutorial discretion is dead, right? Because beyond this language and the guidance documents are also um, choices that were made by the administration to revoke or rescind pre-existing guidance on prosecutorial discretion. So one key document that was rescinded as a result of this administration's policies was the Jay Johnson Priorities Memo published in November 2014, named after the former Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. And the Johnson Priorities Memo was an important document because it laid out what the prosecutorial discretion policy was for the administration. And it indicated, for example, those with age issues, health, um, pregnancy, and so on, to be um, the types of factors that should be warranted a favorable exercise of discretion. What is unknown is whether other prosecutorial discretion guidance is rescinded or not. There's an outstanding FOIA to determine that particular question. Separate from the rescission of the Johnson Priorities Memo in the summer was a rescission of DAPA, or Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Legal Residents. Um, and while the program itself was never operational because of litigation, the message such a rescission sends to the public, um, or to me at least, is that parents are at most a priority and at least unwelcome. And what can I tell you about DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals? Perhaps it's been addressed in earlier remarks today. It was a policy announced in June 2012. It has enabled nearly 800,000 people who came to the U.S. before the age of 16 are in school or graduated and meet other requirements to receive a type of prosecutorial discretion known as deferred action. And on September 5th, the end of DACA was announced. And how did we get here? Well, we had mixed messages through and through, beginning from when the campaign of the current president began. 
Um, there were campaign promises to end the policy. And then after inauguration, there were, were mixed messages of protecting and dreamers or DACA recipients having nothing to fear um, to news stories about a DACA recipient who was picked up or deported. And then in late June, uh, several states led by the state of Texas wrote a threat letter to the administration saying that if you don't pull DACA from by September 5th, uh, we will sue you. Um, so I think very much in reaction to this threat letter to sue was this announcement by the Attorney General on September 5th in a press conference announcing the end of DACA. And it's important to note that during this press conference, there was one law professor cited in contrast to the 105 law professors who wrote a letter defending the legality of DACA. Um, DACA was declared um, super statutory and unconstitutional, and yet there was very little legal analysis provided to the American public of exactly what was behind that. And then finally, the Attorney General took no questions. And so in reaction to an announcement rescinding a program that was within the jurisdiction of an other department and in the absence of the president and without real legal authority and teeth, um, I can only call that press conference legally dishonest and dehumanizing. And so by the terms of the DACA rescission, um, anybody who currently has DACA retains deferred action and work authorization. The renewal application period for those who had expiration dates between now and March 5th ended on October 5th. And the agency has calculated that more than 30,000 individuals who did qualify for renewal did not make an application. So what does the future of discretion hold? Um, the future is uncertain. Um, on the one hand, the Department of Homeland Security has indicated that prosecutorial discretion can still be exercised on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and this makes sense to some degree, even without that guidepost, because prosecutorial discretion itself is inevitable. Um, the agency has limited resources, and so everyone can't actually be the subject of immigration enforcement. But in my view, how discretion is exercised really matters. If we are in a landscape where no one is a priority, there's real reason to believe that haphazard enforcement or being in the wrong place at the wrong time is what our enforcement policy looks like. Another concern is a tool that is used by the administration to carry out immigration enforcement, such as enforcement actions or what some coin as raids. Last month, 500 undocumented individuals were apprehended in a four-day sweep by Immigration Customs Enforcement. Um, the largest city targeted was Philadelphia in the state of Pennsylvania, where I reside and still am having not been able to get on a plane to you. Um, so the real concern of how enforcement is carried out um, is, is real. And so what is at stake in my view is a breakdown of discretion and the rule of law. And I really hope the administration rethinks its priorities and chooses to use prosecutorial discretion in a fair manner. Thank you. You know, I've done so many of these presentations and panels, especially after being a teaching fellow at Cardozo during last year, but there's a different type of pressure when you have your professors watching you here. <laughs> um, um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the law school, thank 
Uh, thank you, Professor Margulis, for inviting me here. Thank, thank you to everybody who's part of the law review and the administration for organizing this, this really, really awesome and, uh, and cool event. Um, as Professor Margulis mentioned before, I am an immigration attorney at the Bronx Defenders right now. Uh, I have been representing people for about six years who are facing deportation proceedings and who are detained. Uh, most of the clients who I have represented during those past six years are people who have criminal convictions. Um, uh, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you guys today, um, I started thinking about like so many of the things that are wrong in our immigration system, and there are just so many. Uh, but I really think that um, it's important for me to talk a little bit about access to counsel. Uh, for the people who are not very familiar with our immigration system, uh, people who are facing deportation proceedings uh, have the right uh, to have a counsel present with them in immigration court. However, that counsel cannot be paid by the U.S. government. What does that mean? It means that you have people who are not able to have an attorney with them when they are defending themselves against one of the most uh, extreme forms of punishment that we have here in the U.S., which is deportation, permanent exile, without having uh, uh, the help of an attorney. Meaning that if you're too poor uh, to pay for an immigration lawyer, uh, which usually is, uh, who usually are expensive, you just don't get to have one. And you have to face a uh, trained immigration attorney from the government, uh, often in an in a language that you do not speak. And like I say, fair, face one of the harshest consequences. Um, and I talk about access to counsel, not only because uh, it impacts every single one of the individual cases of people who are going through deportation proceedings, but access to counsel really means that you have people who are looking into our immigration laws and the way that they are applied and uh, verifying whether those immigration laws are one, constitutional, and two, whether those immigration laws are being applied correctly by the people uh, who are involved in adjudicating them, right? And, and I have to say, and it's gonna be a little uh, extreme that I'm gonna just cite uh, to a speech that uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions g gave yesterday, uh, but in his speech at the Justice Department's Executive Office of Immigration Review, Attorney General Sessions said that the nation's policies allowed too many asylum seekers to exploit loopholes in a broken, extreme backlog process. And then he said, the system is being gamed. Over the years, smart attorneys have exploited loopholes in the law, court rulings, and lack of resources to substantially undermine the intent of Congress. What is he trying to say here to a certain extent is, you know, people who are immigration attorneys or in general lawyers are starting to find out that there are things that you can do under immigration law that for years, for years, people did not have access to, right? And specifically, I want to talk about an aspect of our immigration system uh, where access to counsel made a huge difference. And I'm going to point uh, to a case uh, in point. Uh, and specifically the area of immigration detention. Let me tell you a little bit uh, and give you a little bit of background on this. Why to talk about immigration detention? First of all, the U.S. government, for people who don't know here, has the legal authority, or unless they allege they have the legal authority, to detain and put people behind bars every time that they believe that somebody is deportable. It doesn't matter if you have been convicted of a crime. If the U.S. government believes that you have violated an immigration law and you are deportable from the US, they have the authority to put you behind bars. Not only that, but also for certain groups of people the US government alleges or under a statute that those people should not be allowed to be released from detention during the pendency of their removal proceedings. So there are certain categories under the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, of people that are under what it's called mandatory detention. For those people, it does not matter 
right, for how long you are detained, you do not have access to what it's called a bond hearing. Meaning, and, uh, and at, this, at this moment, uh, there's a case in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, the case in point is Jennings v. Rodriguez. And the Supreme Court right now will be deciding or in, uh, uh, on whether these provisions under the Immigration and Nationality Act are constitutional. When I worked as an immigration attorney in Arizona, I met somebody who had been in removal proceedings back and forth <coughs> through appeals and, and what else, detained for eight years. Somebody had been <laughs> detained for eight years without having access to a bond hearing. And when I talk about a bond hearing, uh, people might wonder what a bond hearing is. But what a bond hearing is what you have in criminal court, which means pretty much having a judge trying to determine whether the person presents a danger to the community, one, and two, whether the person is at flight risk, meaning are they going to be coming back to immigration court later, right? However, these types of people in these types of categories do not have access under uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act to have these bond hearings. Now, in 2014, for the first time in history, in New York, we're able to find the money to fund a program that allows to have universal representation for every single person who is detained and facing deportation proceedings in New York. So every single person who is detained in New York and is in deportation proceedings gets to have a lawyer. And you know what that did? The moment that, uh, and I was one of the first NIFAP attorneys, NIFAP is the name of the program, the moment that we enter into the field, and we started realizing that this was going on. We said, this is unfair. Our clients are behind bars. There's no way that our clients should be behind bars. They do not present a danger to the community. They, they will be coming back to court because they have a form of relief under our immigration laws. Why are they being detained? So what we did is we started filing habeas corpus petitions in front of uh, the district court in the Southern District of New York. One of those cases eventually made it to the Second Circuit. And in 2015, Laura v. Shanahan was decided. And in Laura v. Shanahan, um, the Second Circuit decided that every single person who was uh, under one, detained under one of these provisions of the INA, specifically INA 236C, should have access to a bond hearing within six months of their detention. It's not that we were asking the government to just release everybody. All that we were asking to the, uh, to the courts is to allow them to have a legal process, to allow them to have due process to be able to determine whether their freedom should be taken away or not, depending on their circumstances, right? Um, you know, you might be wondering what's the difference between criminal detention and immigration detention. And I'm gonna just uh, read you something that Justice Soto, Sotomayor said during the oral argument for Jennings uh, v. Rodriguez uh, about a week ago, or less than a week ago. She's asking the, uh, the, the attorney uh, for the government, and she goes, in which ways is immigration detention different than criminal detention? She continues, I mean, I understand right now that when you detain non-citizens, you put them in orange suits. They are shackled during visitation and court visits. They are subject to surveillance and street searches. They are referred to by number, not by name. So in which ways is immigration detention different than criminal detention? And I ask you that question after reading that. Is there any difference? between immigration detention and criminal detention? And the answer, if you ask me, uh, is no. There's no difference. However, for years we have had this system in our country that has prevented people, taking people away from their families and their communities and taking away their freedom without providing them with due process. And there, our criminal justice system, given federal or state law, every single person who is processed through the criminal justice system at some point has the ability to access a judge and ask for a bail hearing. 
to determine whether their freedom should be taken away or not. Unfortunately, for certain groups of people in our immigration context, uh, that is just not the case right now. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this. Um, one of the really cool things about the decision in the Laura v. Uh, uh, Shanahan case is that not only we were able to get bond hearings for people within six months, uh, but also one of the things that we were able to do is that we shifted the burden from the respondent, the respondent is the person, the non-citizen, to the government. Because every single one of the bond hearings that you had before, just think about this. You have somebody, let's say from Guatemala, who came to the U.S. in 2004. In 2014, for some reason, he was put into deportation proceedings. And during those deportation proceedings, it was his burden even if he was, represent, and, and, uh, he was not represented by an attorney, to prove that he was not a danger to the community and that he was not a fly risk. It was not the government's burden to prove why they were jailing him. It was his burden to prove that he was not, uh, he was not one of those two things. So one of the things that we were able to do in Laura is we were able to convince the Second Circuit to shift that burden to the government. Because the government should have the burden of proving why the government is taking somebody's freedom away, right? So that changed things completely. Absolutely the way that we were representing uh, people uh, in New York more than anything, because a lot of the resources that we were using as attorneys were used to get people out of jail, get people out of immigration detention. And just to give you a number, in 2011, uh, there was a study group that was put together in New York. I think that Lenny was actually part of the study group. Uh, maybe Mark as well. And in a study that was published in 2011, they found the following. Only 3% of people who were detained and didn't have a lawyer had success in their immigration cases, meaning they were able to prevent their deportation. That compared to 74% of people who were not detained and who had access to an attorney. So that right there tells you the huge gap and the huge difference that getting people out of jail, first, uh, has, and second, uh, having access to a counsel. And all of these things wouldn't have been possible without um, Mr. Laura, who was the person uh, whose case went in front of the Second Circuit, uh, to, be able, uh, to, to be able to generate all of these changes. One last thing before, I know that I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I need to finish. I'm just gonna, leave you with the story of Mr. Laura, because I think that is very telling of so many of the, of, of the themes that I'm, um, that I'm talking about today. Alexander Laura is a lawful permanent resident, meaning that he had a green card from the Dominican Republic, who lived in the U.S. since he was seven years old. Mr. Laura was pa placed into removal proceedings and detained based on a 2010 drug offense for which he had been sentenced to probation with no jail time, meaning that when he went and was prosecuted for that drug offense, he never had to serve a single day in jail. He just got probation. His immigration detention without bond forcibly separated Mr. Roller for the first time from his family in Brooklyn. He left behind his fiance, his ailing mother for whom he was provided. He lost his job and he lost, uh, he lost his two-year-old son who was placed, placed into foster care. All of those things he lost to immigration detention. Even though he was eligible for immigration relief, meaning he had a way of defending himself against deportation, he still didn't have the ability to get out of immigration jail. And it was thanks to the works of the attorneys who worked together, eventually we were able to get a $5,000, think about that, $5,000, for somebody who had never spent a single day in jail and for, for whose conviction had already passed four years uh, to be able to be, uh, for him to be reunited with his family and, uh, and, and his community. Last thing, uh, Mary Ellen talked about the future being a little uh, cloudy, and I, I often feel like that, for sure. But I do think that people like you, law students, and people who are energized about all of the things and outraged about all of the things that you're hearing every day are really the future. So I see you and I see a lot of hope in what I think that you could do with your law degree and what you could do in the future as lawyers to protect our constitution, to protect 
our, uh, our communities and, and, and to really make this uh, our future a little brighter. Thank you. So, hello everyone, thank you for being here today. I'm Lenny Benson, I'm gonna to talk to you about children or children first. I have 35 slides, there's no way we're gonna spend enough time on them. Um, so I wanna say as a caveat in the beginning that if you're interested in this topic, if you'll visit um, Safe Passage Project's website, which is up there on the slide right now, under resources you'll find manuals, videos, uh, testimony, all different kinds of things that will help you go deeper and learn more. And I uh, would say that if anyone wants a copy of these slides, they can contact me. The, I, I would send you PDFs of the slides. So please feel free to say, I want to learn more. Um, I, I too also want to thank you, Peter, uh, the Law Review, the Law School, my colleagues who have spoken today. I like to say when I do this speech that um, there isn't a person in the room who couldn't change a person's life. So I am an academic, and I do study and write about this field, and I teach in this field, but I also, on my extra time, created a pro bono project that's grown into a nonprofit that is currently representing 700 children and adds between 150 to 300 cases a year. So we've closing cases and we're adding cases. And the way that I was able to do that was going into rooms like this, saying, listen to this, and then stand up and do something. So are there people in the room right now who are um, nonprofit uh, organizations that do anything with immigration? Because I, oh, I met you, okay. You guys, see these people over here? If you're a lawyer in this area, go talk to those people over here. <laughs> and then you wonderful people over there, we're gonna connect, right? So I'll share my resources with you and you can share resources with them. And there is a really great community of mentoring. And if you're here with law enforcement, government, or uh, DHS, you too have a role to play in this because what my thesis is today is that the system we're using right now to adjudicate children's claims of protection or adjudicate their right to remain in the United States was cobbled together. Maybe we could say it's like putting grandpa's raincoat on a toddler. It's not, it might keep the kid dry a little bit, but it's hard to maneuver, it's hard to see the kid inside there, and it really is ill-fitting, and so I'm gonna try to illustrate that for you. So uh, one of the problems, I think, in adjudicating children's claims is the numbers began to rapidly grow. And this is very similar to Mary Ellen Fullerton's talk when the EU was overwhelmed by such large numbers. What was it, Mary Ellen? Three million in Turkey? A million plus? Yeah. More. So let's double that. Okay. So are we overwhelmed? In the last three years, uh, the United States has had about 203,000 children apprehended at our southern border. This is a time of dropping apprehensions, despite what the political rhetoric might be at our southwest border as well. And there's not many apprehensions of children at our north borders or our ports of entry at the airports. So are we overwhelmed? We're a country of 330 million people. 203,000 people, if we had to fit them in this room, seems like a lot. But this is over three years, and I think it's a country we're capable of dealing with this. Instead, the reaction we're seeing both in the agencies that adjudicate the claims and in Congress is a kind of uh, really overreactive panic. This is just to give you some idea of children placed into removal. All children apprehended at the southwest border, but for Mexican children, are placed into removal proceedings. So we see there was about 8,000 8, cases, close to 9,000, and then it leaps in 2014, 2015, 2016. By 2016, it was representing 20% of the docket cases going into the immigration courts. Now, you've heard phrases in the media and maybe you would agree the immigration courts have too big a workload. There's a little over 300 judges and 625,000 cases. And you can find that waits are quite long in many places. But a lot, a lot of this work is also children, median age of 14, being placed into removal. So one of the things I want to say to you is, did we have to, do we have to approach the problem this way? 
This is a graph taken last week from the Track Center. Some of you who do research in the field know that Syracuse University is a standard FOIA request where they get and update lots of information of immigration statistics. And they're showing that as of the last time this report was made, there was about 21,000 new juvenile cases added last year. So in 2014, when we saw that big spike where it went up to several 50,000 plus cases suddenly added, the government said this is a humanitarian crisis. And the way they talked about arresting children at the border, putting them into shelter care, putting them all into removal, was as if it was a kind of child welfare system. They were worried about trafficking, they were worried about the children being victimized, and so they said we're going to, this is a chart, I know you can't read it, this is all the various steps that what happened to unaccompanied children after they're arrested. Um, they are taken into care. I think Luis and I would call it detention. They don't wear orange colored jumpsuits, but they are locked up. And whether it's in a foster care placement, in a house that's locked up, or a severe lockup facility, the children at this point in 2014 were spending about 50, 60 days in detention on average. It's down to 34 days, but it was, for some of the children I've met, it's six months, 10 months in detention. Most, however, are released to their relatives. Mm -hmm. So in part, we have to say there's two factors going on here. We have children seeking relatives in the United States. That's why they're not going to Nicaragua or they're not going to Colombia. Oh, I should have said the majority of these children are from Central America, the vast majority, the Northern Triangle. I'm sorry, I left out this slide. Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. So when they're released to their relatives, Part of that is a desire for family safety, family reunification. But another part of it is, why are the children making this incredibly dangerous journey? Where many anecdotal evidence will say there's um, Catholic Charities has reported they believe that at least 80% of the children fe female and about 60% of the children male are physically or sexually assaulted during the journey. So it's an incredibly dangerous journey. Um, why are they doing this? Because these three nations are in the top five most dangerous places in the world. The highest murder per capita rates, according to the United Nations. So I was speaking at a church recently and it suddenly dawned on me, this is the story of Moses in the bulrushes. Miriam, his sister, and the mother of Moses, whose name is not in the Bible, uh, does not want to uh, give up their child, Moses. But Pharaoh has said all the firstborn sons of the Israelites will be killed. So what do you do? You put your kid into the basket and you hope something better will happen. This is not different than children being put on trains or boats trying to get them out of war zones all over the world. And the UN will tell you that a growing proportion of displaced people and refugees are women and children. In fact, it's representing about 50% now of the movement of people. So in 2014, we see that everyone's arrested, everyone's put into removal, taken into detention, but many are released to relatives within a relatively short period of time. And then the government feels a little conflicted about this, I think, because of the huge numbers. And the EOIR, the Immigration Court, and the Corporation for National Community Service create Justice AmeriCorps, the first government somewhat funded, it's not very much money, we can all hire a lawyer for $19,000 a year. Um, that's how much it was. Gave grants throughout the country, and this is the picture of um, the first uh, <clears throat> core of the Justice AmeriCorps. And they, the idea was that these 50, 60 young legal professionals, paralegals and lawyers would spread out across the country and they would be there as screeners and try to assist young people to find counsel. As you already heard from Luis, it makes a tremendous difference. What's the response in 2017? After the president announced his list of rules or concepts or principles that are non-negotiable for the administration if we're going to have a restoration of DACA, one of the things he said is he's adopting an approach that some members of Congress have suggested. We will detain all children at the border and within a period of 48 hours to seven days, we will adjudicate whether or not they have an asylum claim while they're in detention without counsel, and if they do not have a severe trafficking claim or an, a recognized asylum claim, they will be returned to their country of origin. Now, under existing law, 
we do have an agreement with Mexico because Mexico has assured us the children are returned into a child welfare agency. That's actually not true, and there's lots of reports by Amnesty International and others that show that, but we haven't reneged on that agreement with Mexico. With Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, current law requires us to make sure the child is placed in a safe environment, and we really can't do that. Um, so we haven't been re repatriating Central Americans at a rapid pace. We have been putting them into removal. So my thesis now turns to whether the president wants to change it to expedited adjudication at the border or the current system we have where kids are arrested, detained, released to relatives, and then everyone is in removal court, is that the best way to adjudicate claims? This chart, which again, I'm sure you can't read, are what the government might call loopholes, but what I call statutory grants of protection. All of these little boxes are forms of potential relief that a child could qualify for under existing domestic law. These boxes, which I've made yellow or blue or bigger, are the main forms of relief for, ch for children, especially the special immigrant juvenile status, which you're going to hear in the last panel today, or a child's claim for asylum. But notice that these things, I've colored them differently because the immigration judge is not the original forum or place to hear this claim. Instead, the child has to do something like this picture. Apprehended by border patrol, taken into foster care, released to a family member, go to the immigration court, now go to family court, now work in family court, now file a petition with the USCIS, now get that adjudicated, hopefully within 180 days, although they're not doing it anymore, then turn to bring it back to the immigration court, and then maybe if everything is good and the quote is not backlogging, you can apply for adjustment of status. What can the immigration court do, this forum that we think is the right place to put all these children's cases? Well, there's under agreement right now that all these children go to apply for asylum before the USCIS, not before the immigration court in the first instance. And that is really appropriate in some ways because it's an informal, non-adversarial interview. And the asylum office responded in the beginning by expediting these cases. So originally, from the time you filed, you might get a three-week interview, a four-week interview. Sadly, with the volume of work and the lack of resources and the, de and the deferment of staff to the southern border, um, the, we now are seeing five months, six month delays, even for children's cases. And if you're an adult and you're applying for asylum because the kids' cases are prioritized, you may have a three year wait. Special immigrant juvenile status, usually adjudicated completely before the USCIS after you've completed your family court. Again, you're going to hear about that later. Family petitions where someone might be sponsoring you could lead to termination, but those are done by USCIS. U visas for victims of crime, T visas for victims of trafficking, they're not adjudicated by the immigration court. They're done by USCIS. So why are we in immigration court at all? Immigration court is the wrong forum, the wrong place to be adjudicating protection claims for children. And prosecutorial discretion, which Shoba talked about so beautifully and eloquently, in 2016 represented 39% of all the immigration cases. What does that mean? Why 40% of the time was the government closing the cases? Because they never should have been brought in the first place. Because we don't have a system where prosecutors decide which cases go into the immigration court. We have assembly line justice, where officials within Customs and Border Protection and within ICE who are doing their job believe they have no discretion, that they have to write up the charging document and they lodge it with the court. It doesn't go through the funnel of being reviewed by an attorney first. Imagine if the police took everything to court without the DAs, or the IRS let their agents bring everything to court without going through agency process. What would happen to your courts? So this is just a picture of the screening room we had until last month at the New York Immigration Court. The court is expanding. The government's response to the crush of cases is to add more judges, so they're dividing the screening room into three new courtrooms. And we're there with students and volunteers and lawyers because, as you've already heard, no one's entitled to a free lawyer. Justice AmeriCorps has been defunded by the Trump administration, and even then it was only a few hundred kids that were getting represented. Here's just another picture of the process. I'm not going to repeat it, but I held this sign up at the White House to try to explain all the different fora that touch just one kind of case. 
and it had the negative reaction. I meant it to be positive. Like, look at that star at the end, you get a green card. But instead, people go, oh, it's complicated. And I said, oh my gosh, this is the summary. If I unfolded this, it would take the entire room to tell you each step. So that I've made this one for you. These are, you know, does it confuse you? Imagine being 14 and without a lawyer. Asylum, how does a child articulate their membership in a particular social group? Do we have clear published case law? No. You can file for asylum on your own, right? It's a 12-page form, has to be filed in English, must have corroboration in many cases. Maybe you have a claim of past persecution. You know how to establish the nexus requirement. We have, you know, I'm just going through to explain that this is a complicated ecosystem. And political rhetoric and rapid decision making without understanding all the interacting moving pieces will lead to more bad adjudication models. Where's Steve Lagomsky? He's my mentor. He wrote one of the best articles ever called uh, uh, Forum Choices. And he wrote about the values of good adjudication. I'm paraphrasing some of his work. Later in the written article, I will cite you extensively. But what do we want in a good system? We want fairness, accuracy, and we want efficiency because we don't want to have delay to become an incentive for abuse of a system. Will our design generate false positives? As Mr. Sessions appears to have said, I actually didn't listen to the testimony. He was calling lawyers who are seeking asylum for people dirty lawyers. Maybe there are fraudulent, disrespectful lawyers, but there's a lot of people who are making new law by representing children when there's no, there's no published case law, really, about children's claims. But if we don't design a system well, will we, fall, will we incentivize poor applications? So here's the difference lawyers can make. Um, whatever system we're gonna use, I think we need lawyers in it. This is just New York data over a 10-year period, 13-year period. 86.3% of the cases where a child was represented got some kind of positive result. Might have been a closure of the case. It might have been ultimately some relief granted by the court after visiting all those other places that I talked about. And without an attorney, only 15% of the time was the child able to get the case even closed or moved or anything good to happen. So that's about six times the difference, right? If you have an attorney, you're six times more likely to get this positive result. And this pattern is largely the same in all the other courts. So when you have that kind of huge dramatic difference, what I'm basically saying is whatever system we design, and because children are children, we should have appointed counsel. Just a few more examples. In absentia is an order of removal where you didn't show up to court. And we don't keep children in detention, hopefully um, in excess of long periods, as you heard, like Mr. Laura, because of a 20-year-old settlement called Flores. We, uh, the government is forced to release children to the least restrictive environment. However, Mr. Trump has called for Congress to abrogate that 20-year-old settlement and to say that children can be detained indefinitely. Well, he might be doing that because he doesn't want to have in absentia orders. But if you're represented, it's a very small percentage of lawyers who lose their clients or clients who stop cooperating with their lawyers. So uh, again, a huge percentage of children who don't come to court, who get an order, it's probably because they didn't know they qualified for all those different potential forms of relief. They never got to talk to a lawyer, never understood their rights, just were afraid or took bad advice from the community of, why would you go to court? They're just going to deport you. And again, there's more data that I have that over and over again, the, the representation impact is enormous. When process interferes with the adjudication of substantive protection, when there are no lawyers, it's as if substantive protections just disappear. So what do I recommend? Well, we need to sit down, calmly look at the data, share the data, analyze the reasons children are coming, analyze the different types of children that are coming, and we need to design a form of adjudication at, um, that matters along with representation. We need to avoid backlogs. I agree with that, particularly because children, they have a disproportionate psychological, social, economic impact when they're in unstable situations. There's a lot of sociological evidence that when they have uncertainty about the stability of their environment, it causes lifelong damage and trauma. 
But we also want accuracy. We don't want ICE raids or arrests at the border or border patrol officers in the middle of the desert looking at a kid, maybe not even speaking their language. Many of the children coming from Central America are indigenous speakers. Their Spanish is their second or even third language. And we want a forum that's appropriate for a child communicating and for the context of a child opening up. We, of course, want it to be a judicious program, whether it doesn't have to be a judge perhaps making all the adjudications, but we want someone who's neutral. Ultimately, we need an opportunity to be heard. We need a mechanism that grinds out to make sure we're getting accurate decisions. And usually that means we need review. Another thesis that Steve Lukomsky has proved over and over again, the value of judicial review, the value of administrative review, has this interactive effect of improving adjudication and improving performance within the entire adjudication model. What the government is proposing now, there would be no transparency and no review, either administrative or judicial. When you are a Border Patrol officer or an ICE officer, and even if you're well-meaning, if no one's going to look at your nature of your adjudications or how you're making them, we will not know if there's false negatives or false positives or even who's, what's happening to who, because it will simply be out of our eyes, out of our mind. And that's not the best way for American justice to operate. So I hope everyone in the room is going to think about Gee, six times more likely for a child to get relief if I step forward? I hope you will. That's it. Thank you. As Peter mentioned, I'm here uh, with the Department of Justice's Executive Office of Immigration Review, EOR, which operates the immigration courts. Uh, before I get into my speech, I wanted to particularly thank Peter uh, for bringing me here today. Uh, so Peter, when I was uh, working my way up in academia and policy positions, Peter was a wonderfully supportive and generous colleague, and it's a reason why I came here today to Rhode Island and worked through the relatively extensive permissions process uh, <laughs> to speak here. Um, and I should say too, um, Peter has really brought together here um, some of the leading lights in the immigration law field. And not all of you may know this, um, but some of the professors in this room, um, I should say, uh, you know, some of the other leading lights um, besides Peter, you know. People like Steve Lagomsky, like Mary Ellen Fullerton, like Peter Shuck, like Lenny Benson. Uh, these are the people that write the textbooks that I'm sure are used here to teach immigration law, that have written some of the foundational articles uh, in the field uh, at a time when law schools were not as interested as, to in, as today in teaching immigration law and holding symposia like this. And these were people, when I came into this field, that I really looked up to, I know a lot of us did. Um, so it is a real, I think I'm speaking here more in my personal capacity, but it is a real pleasure for me to uh, be here today, and, and, uh, and I think Peter deserves a lot of credit for how this came together. Uh, so, uh, although I am the only government representative here today, I think, I am not authorized to speak for the entire government on all these issues. <laughs> Uh, I am authorized to speak today about asylum fraud and EOR's Fraud and Abuse Prevention Program, which I supervise in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the program investigates um, both fraud by immigrants and fraud against immigrants. And I'll talk a little bit about those later. So first, asylum fraud. What is asylum fraud when we talk about it? Asylum, as I think you know, it's an application for relief to stay here in the country on grounds that you fear persecution if you were to be deported, colloquially speaking. Um, but asylum adjudications, by definition, are made on incomplete information. Uh, most of it uh, happens in another country. Um, so uh, fraud has been a program that, or been a problem that has been looked at for decades by various government agencies and various reports. It can occur in a number of ways. Um, the most prominent is when an attorney or a preparer in exchange for money uh, will prepare and file fraudulent documents, written statements supporting details about an applicant's asylum claim, sometimes with that applicant's knowledge, sometimes without that applicant's knowledge. 
so as the UIR director said this summer, application and benefit fraud in immigration proceedings undermines the overall integrity of our immigration law system, places unwarranted burdens on taxpayers, and puts public safety and national security at risk. Or as the Attorney General uh, said yesterday at my office, as this system becomes overloaded with fake claims, it cannot deal effectively with just claims. Uh, there was a report in 2015 that the U.S. Government Accountability Office wrote on asylum fraud, and it said asylum decisions can have serious consequences. Granting asylum to an applicant with a genuine claim protects the asylee from being returned to a country where he or she could be persecuted, or has been. On the other hand, granting asylum to an individual with a fraudulent claim jeopardizes the integrity of the asylum system by enabling the individual to remain in the United States, apply for certain federal benefits, and pursue a path to citizenship. Uh, so, in that report in 2015, the Government Accountability Office found that USCS and EOR have limited capabilities to detect asylum fraud, um, and recommended that each agency assess fraud risks, fraud risks across the asylum process. So that brings us to EOR's Fraud and Abuse Prevention Program. Um, and I'll give a little bit of history and then talk about what it does. Uh, the history in 2006, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez and the Bush administration issued a directive to develop a procedure for immigration courts to refer fraud cases for investigation and potential criminal prosecution. As a result, the fraud program was created. Uh, the Fraud and Abuse Prevention Council is Brea Burgi. Um, she has three major responsibilities by regulation. One is to serve as a point of contact uh, relating to concerns about possible fraud upon the immigration courts, particularly with respect to matters involving multiple proceedings, systemic risks. Uh, secondly, she coordinates uh, with investigative authorities. This is Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, other appropriate agencies. Um, in identifying and responding to such fraud. And third is notifying disciplinary authorities, uh, EORs, disciplinary council, state bar authorities, um, regarding attorneys or credit representatives that are committing fraud. So in practice, the fraud program investigates complaints and it takes appropriate actions. Uh, what does that mean? It means that fraud program personnel work closely with law enforcement authorities and prosecutors on federal and state and local levels to investigate and prosecute fraud. Uh, we have in Washington, D.C., uh, a team now of, depending how you count, about four people. Uh, there's a director, there's a lawyer and a half, there's now a full-time investigator, there are support staff, and what they will do is investigate, um, as I mentioned, uh, fraud claims by immigrants, systemic asylum fraud claims, and fraud against immigrants. Uh, they coordinate with the Attorney Discipline Program and State Bar Council to discipline attorneys. They send cease and desist letters. And we have provided training uh, to EOR personnel like immigration judges on identifying and reporting fraud. We've now visited 31 of the 59 immigration courts across the country. So in getting into the two types of fraud, first let's talk about fraud by immigrants. Uh, a major case recently was called Operation Fiction Writer in New York City. And what happened, and um, I believe can, uh, the indictments were unveiled in 2013, uh, the FBI conducted an undercover investigation into asylum fraud um, that was perpetrated by a ring of lawyers and law firms and attorneys and interpreters and involved a large number of individuals, I believe, uh, resulted in criminal charges against 30 defendants, eight convictions, and over 4,000 applicants that received asylum fraud. So what happened was that the FBI uh, informants were wearing wires, they videotaped defendants. Um, these were asylum applications from China where the applicants were making false claims, uh, forced abortion, abortion persecution based on Christianity or Falun Gong. And here you would have law firms that prepared false applications. They coached clients how to lie. Uh, the applications would uh, commonly be very similar. Uh, same facts about Falun Gong, about a forced abortion, um, different names that were cut and pasted. 
um, certificates to prove an applicant belonged to a church. Um, an interpreter from the law firm would come to an interview. If the person didn't say it correctly, the interpreter would translate something different. Um, and they were all charged, and many of them uh, were convicted, although not all. Um, so what the fraud program uh, do, did with that um, is assisted the investigation, and um, they still do this with federal and state offices across the country. Uh, we work with ICE Homeland Security investigations. They also prosecute child trafficking. Um, we often see these issues are related um, or perpetrated by the same people. Um, and we work with U.S. attorney's offices across the country um, to prosecute things like that. Um, secondly, the Fraud and Abuse Prevention Program investigates fraud against immigrants. Uh, this is often by lawyers or people pretending to be lawyers, notarios is the common term. And these are scams against immigrants and the unauthorized practice of law. Uh, the two are often linked. Um, notarios often submit frivolous or fraudulent applications, and this is often uh, without the clients knowing, but paying a lot of money for the service and often to their detriment. Uh, it's a widespread problem. Um, uh, these unauthorized practitioners will routinely misrepresent their qualifications to individuals, most of whom are immigrants who don't speak English, who are not familiar with the legal system, who might not understand the qualifications necessary to practice. And what this means is that thousands of immigrants are defrauded every year, and you have a glut of fraudulent applications being filed with the system, uh, which clog the system and impact the integrity of the process. And I'll mention one example that happened in Rhode Island recently. Uh, in July, uh, July 11th, actually, 2017, uh, Nyman Nafeng uh, was sentenced to 27 months in federal prison. Um, he pled guilty to seven counts of mail fraud and two counts of visa fraud after being indicted in January 2016 on seven counts of mail fraud, eight counts of visa fraud, 10 counts of identity theft, and one count of money laundering. Um, what happened is that he was indicted for a pretty common scam in which he promised immigrants uh, access to a work permit, uh, to employment authorization. Um, but what the immigrants didn't know is that he filed for asylum on their behalf uh, without them knowing. So what that meant is that when you file an asylum application, if it's not adjudicated within six months, which is pretty common, um, you would get a work authorization um, he charged about uh, 1500 and 2500 per applicant for this. He advertised the scam on flyers and local businesses on the internet. Um, but what these people didn't know, um, in that they didn't know they were filing an asylum application, is once that ap application is denied, they are put into removal proceedings. Uh, this is not always to their benefit. There are some variations of this. There's something called a 10-year green card scam. Um, and it's a little similar in that someone will say, oh, if you've been in the country for 10 years, you can get a green card. What that really means is that someone will file an asylum application. The asylum application is denied. You are then referred into immigration court. There are some situations in which you can get status and get a green card if you qualify uh, for what's known as cancellation of removal under uh, extreme and exceptionally unusual hardship, which is very hard to meet. If you don't meet that, you are deported. Um, many people don't know that when they're paying their money over. Um, there are recently other scams that we're seeing. Um, one in New York um, was a lawyer, or I'm sorry, a representative, Carlos Davila. Um, he had created a ID for ICE card, which he sold for $200. Um, which he said in some in substance, oh, when ICE, um, you know, if when ICE comes for you, just show them the card. And he printed it up in the back of his office in the Bronx. Um, so what happened is that after a news article was published uh, in the New York City media, um, our office de-accredited him from representing people. Um, the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs then investigated him and is seeking 1.3 million in fines from him. Um, and these are the kind of actions that are uh, the organizations that we work with across the country, particularly with notarios. We work with um, state and locals, uh, even more so than the federal government, um, because there is no federal statute for unauthorized practice of law. Um, but certain states um, have updated their laws recently uh, to account for this. Certain 
local attorney <coughs> general's offices or DAs have really made an emphasis on this and one of the key things our program does is working with them um, to refer information over to them um, so they can take action. Um, so in conclusion, um, I know I talked with a few people here over the course of the uh, conference about things like this happening in Rhode Island. Uh, I would love to put you in touch with the people in my program. Um, you can absolutely email me um, and I'm happy to put you in touch and talk, uh, talk about this. Um, and, uh, and I'll just leave it there. All right, thanks very much. Any remarks from our panelists? Um, I just forgot to give my numbers on Rhode Island's children, which I looked up. You can go to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, and they publish data by state. And so unaccompanied minors apprehended and then taken into the custody of the federal government, there were 877 children released to Rhode Island in the past four years. In Massachusetts, it was 4,657. Um, those two numbers, they seem quite high, especially in a state like Rhode Island. You, your population is not as big, but you don't even make the top uh, 15 states. So, um, sorry, maybe that's good. But it, does, it, it does mean, just, just so you know, that this is not just, people often visualize this problem as a Texas problem or an Arizona problem. New York is the fourth largest recipient of unaccompanied children because their family members are residing in the United States, and so when they're released, that's where they're coming from. Can I add something? Yeah. Um, Mark, I asked you this yesterday, but since we're on the record right now, and hopefully the <laughs> attorney sessions actually was listening to this, um, I, I, I'm fully on board with the idea of prosecuting uh, asylum fraud and prosecuting the people who are taking advantage of immigrants and who are pretty much, for a lot of them, placing them in removal proceedings uh, without, uh, without any form of relief available to them. Uh, but the one uh, question or concern that I have is the Department of Justice is not using the same energy and the same uh, uh, type of uh, resources to actually help the victims who are actually placed in these precarious situations. For example, somebody who had no idea was applying for asylum and who eventually ended up being placed in, uh, into deportation proceedings. It is my understanding that uh, the Department of Justice, as a law enforcement agency, is able to issue what it's called a U visa certification. And that might be something that the Department of Justice can do in order to not only prosecute the people who are committing and taking advantage of immigrants, but actually helping out the immigrants who are victims of these crimes. All right, thanks for the observation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, the New York State Human Rights Commission will take into consideration the victimization and they will issue a new certification. I think our problem is the victim of crime certification has been so successful as part of community policing and part of protecting immigrants and victims of domestic violence, et cetera, that we have a huge backlog in the applications. And so we really need Congress to look more closely and carefully and make the availability of that protection proportionate to the size of our population. And Shoba, you were fabulous. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> I have another question for Mark. Uh, this is about the uh, issue that Lenny raised, which is access to legal representation. <clears throat> I know EOR has, at least in the past, had a program on providing counsel to immigrants with mental disabilities. Uh, and I, I certainly think that's a very badly needed program, tough enough for someone who who doesn't have a disability to deal with the ins and outs of immigration, as Lenny illustrated with her graphics for us, uh, particularly difficult for someone who has a mental disability. Uh, is that program still going on? And uh, if so, what's your evaluation of how it's working? Sure, I can offer you a little bit of, um, of information on that and then tell you the right people to talk to on the evaluation. Uh, so the program is still going on. It's called the National Quality Representative Program. Uh, NQRP, uh, and it stemmed out of a lawsuit uh, called Franco Gonzalez, I believe, um, Franco, um, which was brought in the uh, Central District of California, one of the California districts, and, um, uh, and settled. And through that program, uh, EOIR's Office of Legal Access Programs, OLAP, 
Um, uh, I believe, uh, I'm not the expert on this, um, OLEP is, but they, I believe they have a contract uh, with Vera Institute that then subcontracts to various providers around the country um, to provide representation um, to detainees with mental disabilities. Um, and I believe the, uh, there was a court ruling that was based on the Rehabilitation Act um, that stemmed this. Um, so the program is very much um, up and running. Um, there are uh, um, the litigation, I believe there are um, uh, like monitoring hearings um, that uh, are still ongoing um, that are overseen by that court. Um, I'm starting to get beyond my specialization, but there are lawyers down the hall for me work on this. Um, the, the place to look actually is um, on EOIR's website, which is quite good. It's, it is, there is a page there, Office of Legal Access Programs, um, and I'm happy to talk more. Um, right. The folks um, like the director there, um, and um, well, Steve Lang, and also, uh, I don't know if you remember Amelia Wilson from uh, New York, who's working there now, um, are very uh, committed to that program. But that said, there's a schizophrenic man who's about to have his final merits hearing because OLAP doesn't yet have it subcontracted out to cover him in Batavia. And so we were desperately running around trying to find pro bono counsel. Um, I think we finally did. I think NYPA finally was able to do it. But uh, it's a beautiful idea, and it did take litigation. So some of you may be saying, well, why not children? Why didn't we litigate that? I didn't cover it in my presentation. The Ninth Circuit said that Congress had structured the judicial review or the judicial challenge that the only way a child can say, as a matter of due process, I'm entitled to a free lawyer, is to go to your immigration hearing, ask for a lawyer, go to your BIA appeal and ask for a lawyer, file a, a petition for review and ask for a lawyer. <coughs> right, we can do all that, right? Okay, and so basically that the case was seen as not judicially presented in the right forum. So we don't have litigation yet that similarly forces the federal government to provide lawyer, children to lawyer, lawyers to children. If I can add something to that, I know that we're running out of time. I was actually one of the first Franco attorneys, and I only mention this because the U.S. government is only obligated to provide attorneys for people with mental illnesses in certain districts in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada because the class members of the lawsuit belong to those districts. Um, but the U.S. government at some point decided that they needed to provide counsel for the rest of the country because they said they're going to sue us again. However, seven years later, we're still <laughs> here today, and the program hasn't been fully established in the country. And I, I'm afraid that that might be one of the programs that is going to get cut off uh, during this administration. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists for such uh, interesting and concise presentations. Uh, I have a particular question to, to pose to Lenny, um, and I really loved your thought about design, and I'm sure that uh, in your more elaborate uh, articles you'll, you'll uh, address this at great length, but I wondered if you could offer us any thoughts right now about how other systems in the world uh, deal with unaccompanied children because it's a problem everywhere uh, in terms of forced migration and many other countries aren't um, hobbled by the common law adversarial model that, that uh, we are very much attracted to. So in kind of any thoughts or insights you have from looking elsewhere? Right. So, um, again, I'm assuming the question you're asking me is children who actually get to the border of a nation. So just yes. like they've crossed that border out of Hungary, right? And they've managed to get somewhere and they're asking for help. So, um, unfortunately, uh, I, I have been working on a book for several years with Mary Kroc of Sydney, Australia. It should be coming out in January from Elgar Press. And there are 25 articles talking about around the world's treatment of unaccompanied minors. Um, some nations, I think Canada is probably so far the best in that uh, they do have a pretty robust legal aid system of appointing counsel for children and you go to their equivalent of an asylum office. You don't have this adversarial hearing. In Britain, they've used uh, complementary protection where they basically have allowed mostly Afghani boys and some others who've managed to reach British shores 
uh, just a temporary status until they're 18, and then it's putting it off to another day. So Kids in Need of Defense, which is a national, nationwide organization that does a lot of juvenile justice work for in immigrants, has opened an office in London because there are 65,000 young people who have turned 18 who now need counsel to try to make art, Article 8 um, arguments, which is under the International Human Rights Convention, that they cannot be returned even if they didn't have an asylum claim because their entire life now is in Britain. Um, I'm not giving you a really good solution yet, am I? Right. So, <laughs> so basically, I think that Australia has dealt with it by interdicting all the ships and not accepting any children. Um, really, the whatever the system is, it's going to have to be adaptive to flows and to patterns, and it's going to have to have advocates ingrained into the system. Because, of course, competency issues, trauma, uh, trauma-informed interviewing, and then an adjudication model that will be transparent and fair. I think it would be answer some of the national security concerns and also some of the concern of children's well-being, the trafficking concerns, as well as developing a body of guidelines and law to adjudicate children's claims that are more robust. I don't know if you know of a country where you love how they do it, please tell me. <laughs> Other questions? I'm just going to say your microphone. I was hoping um, to have these actually sort of answer the questions we asked of our esteemed mayor um, about sort of the intersectionality between criminal law and immigration law. And also, um, the question I think, Lenny, that you asked as well about the role of gang databases and unaccompanied minors or undocumented minors. Um, and just talking about when you're sort of on, on the ground, the family folks, where you're seeing those intersections and how you're kind of unwinding that in your work. Right, really quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but uh, thank you for the, for, for the question. Um, one of the grounds for people to be put into deportation proceedings is to have committed a criminal offense here in the U.S. So uh, it doesn't matter whether you have legal status here in the U.S. For example, you have a green card, uh, you can be placed into uh, removal proceedings if you have committed certain criminal offenses. Uh, now, here's, here's the tricky thing about it, and another thing that is so horrible about our, our immigration system. It does not matter how old your conviction is. For example, you could have committed a convi uh, a, a, an offense 20 years ago, have served your sentence, have paid your de debt to society, have reintegrated into the community. 20, days, 20 years later, ICE officers come and knocking on your door and say, you are a deportable sir. So that's how the system is designed. There's no such a thing as a statute of limitations on, uh, on our uh, immigration uh, provisions on that matter. Uh, the other thing that is uh, really uh, uh, shocking is the fact that we think about criminal offenses and the first thing that comes to mind is very serious criminal offenses. But the truth is that, for example, in New York State, somebody can be uh, considered to be deportable, meaning the person can be removed from the U.S. only by having, for example, um, not pay the train fare twice. If they, were, they, if they didn't pay to get into the metro, to get into the train twice, and they were convicted of what, what it's called theft of services, that has been considered and has been uh, already decided by the courts to be uh, what it's called a, convic um, an, a conviction in, involving moral turpitude. And because of that, the person is deportable. So think about this. Somebody who has been in the US for 20, 30, 40 years, who happens to be poor at some point, uh, gets gets into the train without paying for their fare, convicted of theft of services once, convicted of theft of services twice, and that person is deportable from the U.S. So when we talk about representing people who have criminal convictions, we have to be very careful about the type of people that we're thinking we're representing, or the type of people that we're thinking that we're, we're talking about, because it, because it is all over the spectrum. Uh, people who have actually serious criminal convictions and people who don't have serious criminal convictions. People who have, been, have left the criminal justice system maybe yesterday, but also people who have left the criminal ju justice system years ago. And as an attorney who represents people with criminal convictions, one of the, the first things that I have to do and my colleagues have to do all the time is to fight 
these ideas, right? That a criminal offense, for example, makes a person bad, right? And a criminal offense defines a person. And daily, uh, what I have to try to build are narratives around the humanity of my clients and how much more there is uh, to my clients than the one mistake that they made 20, 30 years ago. And, and you're talking about the people that are in the United States put in removal every day, permanent residents travel thinking it's fine to go to their grandfather's funeral or go on an airplane trip and they come back and the databases show that they were convicted 15 years ago of uh, two types of uh, shoplifting. Um, I had a client once, one of chewing gum and one of shaving cream. He was going through a divorce, he was distraught, he went into counseling, he paid his $25 fine. He was removable from the United States, having come to this country when he was seven. Um, the question about gangs and children, um, there, is a, there is a direct uh, correlation between school suspension and um, somehow that information getting into the hands of DHS, Department of Homeland Security and ICE, particularly in Orange County, California, and in Long Island, New York. Uh, we don't know, those that should be confidential under the federal privacy rights for the students. Uh, we don't know how this is happening. It, sometimes it could be school security officers perhaps working with a gang task force. And we seem to see, uh, this is a troublemaker in school, if we allege they're a gang, there's often these things are unsubstantiated, then ICE is re-arresting young people who were in, already in removal, already in the process of securing relief. Some had already been waiting for their green card just to come in the mail. And so now they're doing notice of intention to revoke. And it's all based on allegation. Because when you're seeking um, an immigrant visa, whether it's inside the United States or outside, you can also be precluded from that visa based on admissions of the elements of a crime, not a conviction. So this is a very powerful law, immigration law. And it is robustly enforced. And uh, you know, just today someone was saying, oh, I really miss Obama. We were talking about Trump. And I said, yeah, the 3.2 million people removed under the Obama administration. I think the Obama administration had a philosophy. If we can show we're in control of the borders. If we can show we're vigorously enforcing. We can work for congressional reform. Um, Congress was unwilling to engage in that dialogue, or at least parts of Congress. So we really need um, talk about forum choices again and ideal solutions, it's not just going to be in the courts or in defense or in the agencies. It also needs Congress to partner with us and to look at reality and to think of better solutions for our communities. Thanks for a bunch. Thank you, people.